that. And Rachel, thank you very much you know, for inviting me to, to speak today. I hope that uh, I didn't want to make this very formal. I'd rather just talk and have a discussion about this place. But I think, first of all, I want to know if uh, anybody here has been out to the Valley of 10,000 Smokes. Great, you've gone to Brooks Camp, and then uh, did, you took the, uh, took the bus on out. Did you get a chance to to walk onto the, the sheep? All the way up to Nova Rupta? Backpacking. Backpacking trip, okay. It's, uh, I'll just say it's an inhospitable place. <laughs> that uh, all the times I've been out there, including in 2011, I've been out five times myself, and I guess I've had approximately, well, maybe 50 days in the valley total. That um, I've learned it has a lot of moods, that uh, when you walk into it, you don't really know what's going to happen. And, and, well, let me get into those stories in just a little bit. First, I want to talk, uh, for those that haven't been out there, everybody know what it is? or where it is. It's actually 100 miles west of uh, Kodiak, Alaska. That uh, It is the fourth largest uh, eruption in history, actually bigger than Krakatoa of 1883. The only reason it's not really in the history books is primarily because uh, there was no great uh, human catastrophe out there, that uh, nobody really died, that most of the natives were thinking ahead uh, the week prior to the eruption and they auto-evacuated, they just jumped in their bedarkas and they got out of there because they realized something bad was about to happen, primarily because of all the seismic activity. Um, the eruption took place actually on June the 6th through the 9th of 1912. And um, in that period of time, a brand new volcano was born, Nova Rupta, and uh, evidently what happened was that it emptied a magma chamber beneath Mount Katmai and that kind of traveled but through a dike or fissure over to, well, with the head of the valley there, uh, yeah, there's a couple of mountains out there, uh, Broken Mountain, Baked Mountain, that just burst right up through the ground next to those mountains and spewed out. Well, when I first started this project, it said it, uh, it uh, ejected about five cubic miles of material into the air. But uh, that's since been revised. I was talking to the volcanologists, and they think it may be up closer to about seven cubic miles. And that's a lot of debris to come out of the ground in about a 24 to 30 hour period of time. It completely buried a 44 square mile valley just adjacent, really, to, uh, to Mount Katmai. And what happened is that Katmai then imploded. It fell in on itself and lost between 17 and 1900 feet in altitude just in that three-day period of time. And uh, Marion, you've probably been up in the, in the crater itself in Katmai. It's a fabulous climb to get up there. It takes you probably seven or eight hours from the huts, but it's a well worth it to climb up on those glaciers and to see the lake, which is still getting deeper due to um, just the, uh, the water that runs into it through snow and other, other, other means. But it's about 800 feet deep right now, and it is, there is some thermal activity from what I understand in there, but it's absolutely beautiful and it's unbelievable to look across and see the other side, which is really about two miles away, and I think I have a slide in here that will talk briefly about it. But uh, I became interested in this, and I wanted to go back a little bit in time that uh, I you know, began photography in 1967 when I took a class and became interested in photography in college. And uh, I was really a music major at that time, but I realized that uh, I enjoyed myself much more being kind of on a solo adventure rather than working as a group or with other people, although I marched in the bands and I loved doing that sort of thing. But I enjoyed, I think, just going into my own studio and working. And uh, so I, as I was wandering through a building, I saw a drawing class in that drawing class, there were 12 people drawing, and I was going to an economics class where all the tables were all set up and everybody was sitting. You know how it is. And anyway, as I walked through the building, which I didn't know what it was, it was an art building, and I looked into the drawing class, and I saw these people were milling about, and back in 1966, 67, they were drinking coffee, smoking cigarettes, and drawing. And there was nothing structured about it other than 
the independence and the freedom of being able to sit at your own easel and to draw something. I thought, wow, there are classes in this. <laughs> You know, and to be able to express myself that way rather than having to memorize and deal with other things. And so I took a drawing class and I was hooked. And uh, I've been really doing art since summer of 1966, but I didn't start into photography until 1967. And uh, I must say I graduated and I went on and actually worked with some of the masters with Ansel Adams, Oliver Galliani, and uh, John Schultz back in the, in the middle 70s. And, um, that spurred me on uh, into doing what I do today. Primarily, you can't work with guys like that and not have a sensitivity toward the wilderness and toward the natural world. And so I took that and uh, coupled that with uh, my move to Alaska in 1980. I came up here and uh, I had enough money to get me to Sitka. And uh, that's where I stopped off and uh, couldn't find work. And actually, with a Master of Fine Arts, there was no work for me, you know, back in the States, back in, in the 70s when I graduated. So I thought, well, I'll wash dishes, I'll do anything I can find in Alaska. But uh, it ended up being a boon for me as I got to Sitka in that uh, I had five jobs within a week teaching graphic design, which I knew nothing about, but they thought anybody that had a master's degree can do graphic design. <laughs> and it was cut and paste back then anyway. So it, it was enjoyable. And I did that job and then uh, worked for Salmon Aquaculture Forest Service and the Park Service doing photography for them as well. So I got my fingers into Alaska that way. And when I had an exhibition of work, the park superintendent, a guy by the name of Ernie Suazo in uh, Sitka, saw some of the photographs that I'd been doing uh, in the tidal areas. And uh, he said, you know, he said, these remind me a lot of images I've seen of the Valley of 10,000 Smokes. And I thought, mm, the Valley of 10,000 Smokes, I've, I've never heard of the place. I knew nothing about it, but it had sort of a spiritual name. I looked at the Valley of 10,000 Smokes. It must have been, it, it's something like it could have been Southwestern. The natives must have named it this. And uh, I didn't know anything about it, and it festered in the back of my mind for 20 years, and I realized that in 2000, it's time to go see the place. And so I found out where it was. I really didn't have much information about it. When I got out there, I realized exactly what I'd got myself into. Having been in Alaska for 20 years, I did a lot of backpacking and hiking and climbing and all sorts of other things. So I was prepared for weather and prepared for that eventuality, but I wasn't prepared for what I saw out there. And to be totally honest with you, I was only in there for about four or five days, and I was really ready to come out. I shot about 75 rolls of film, and I hiked back in. I, you, you fly from Anchorage to King Salmon, take the, the trip from King Salmon to Brooks Camp, the bus out there. And at that time, I was working as a volunteer for the Park Service. And so the Park Service took care of me, and they took me out in their Suburban and dropped me off and uh, left me roaming, roaming around in, uh, in that place. And um, it, it was difficult because it, it's like sort of being in a big parking lot in the beginning, that the rivers are running through and the rivers are cold. The first thing you do, there's a baptism of going through Windy Creek. And Windy Creek is running about this deep, and it's really cold. And by the time I took my clothes off and put everything on my pack and walked across, it's only probably about uh, 20 to 25 yards across. I couldn't feel anything from the knees on down. It was cold. But once you get to the other side and warm up and get your clothes back on and walk out, you warm up fast carrying an 80-pound pack. And I realized that somewhere out there, they told me that the, the, the shelters were back in there off of Baked Mountain. I didn't have a clue where they were, so I just put a tent at Six Mile, and I decided that was far enough. And uh, I stayed there for a day or so and just uh, got my breath and then took off from there and went out and found the shelters on, on uh, Broken Mountain. Or, I'm sorry, at Baked Mountain, and then uh, went between Broken and Baked back into see Nova Rupta for the first time. And I have to tell you, Nova Rupta, which is what you see here, is spectacular when you see it. It's just this huge disc in the earth. And it really captivated me that way, but I must say, going back into the experience, that uh, when I left the valley, I was pleased to get back 
and pleased to end up in town and getting a pizza and a cold beer after being out there for that period of time. So, you know, the, we, we sort of missed the comforts of all that. But when I got home and I developed out the 75 rolls of film that I'd taken, I began to look at the images. And all of a sudden, the importance of the place began to settle in. So it wasn't the place, but it was the experience of the place that really captivated me out there. And it was two years later, I went back again. And I went back again in, in 2004, went back in 2008, went back out there again in 2011, all with different uh, ideas in the back of my mind mainly that came from that first trip of inquiry out there. So what ended up happening is from that first group of uh, photographs, uh, somebody saw those actually at James Madison where I'm working also uh, with my wife Kathy Schwartz who is here and she directs the Center for Art Education at James Madison University. She took the job there and I two years later retired from uh, the University of Alaska at KPC. I was there for 20 years. and. Uh, working with Karen Dorcas, who's also here. So, I mean, this is like old home week <laughs> coming back. It's wonderful to see everybody. But uh, I followed Kathy out, uh, out east and uh, enjoyed it out there and took a job there. And while I was there, one of the photos instructors, uh, one of the professors, looked at some of the work that I'd had on exhibition and said, well, you need to talk to George Thompson, who ran the Center for American Places. He saw the images and the book process was born actually in 2001. And so it's been a long, long trip and I'm not gonna get deep into all of this, but uh, it, uh, it took me 12 years to get this publication put together. But there are all sorts of matters and the sales of the publishing company went here, went there and went somewhere else. And uh, so the editor sort of followed me around through all of this. But um, I received a lot of help and support Kathy Carr is sitting here, has, uh, was one of the readers that the publisher sent the original manuscript to, and so she had a chance to add her criticism to it and help tune this whole thing up, so it's uh, worked out quite well. But the, uh, the publication itself, it took a long time coming, but uh, I've been very pleased with it, and I hope you'll have a chance to really take a look at it. They've done, I think, a pretty magnificent job with it. Uh, George Thompson, uh, is a stickler for detail, and his primary focus is on, on photography and photo books, and he's done books of Frank Volke, Richard Misrak, and some of the others that maybe you're familiar with. Um, anyway, I decided I didn't want to just have a picture book. That uh, coffee table book is, is good, and I would certainly like to put my photographs out there that way, but I wanted to add more substance to it, and so I began to tell George the publisher's stories. He said, well, what's this? And I tell him a story. And well, what's that? And I tell him the story about it. And he said, well, you have to write these things. And uh, I wasn't really interested in writing because I'm not a writer. At least I don't consider myself to be a writer. Certainly in, in the, with the MFA program and all my friends that are authors, they have a different gift. That's for sure that they're able to tell these stories. But George said, write it out in a narrative. Don't worry about spelling. Don't worry about anything. Just write it out. That's our job, is to mop it all up. And of course, he sent it out to my readers, and they saw something that was pretty atrocious. <laughs> but anyway, they all bared with me, and it all turned out quite well. But uh, the book ended up being just an introduction that I wrote primarily for the, uh, to the photographs and to the work that I was doing out there. And also, I wanted to build on the history of the place. And if you follow the history of Katmai, uh, Robert F. Griggs was the first to be out there, and he uh, formed an expedition that went out in 1915, but he didn't find the Valley of 10,000 Smokes until 1916, and I think it was the end of June, the 30th or 30th of July, I can't remember, the date that he first stepped foot onto the uh, Ignan Bright Sheet out there, which is a welding of really of pumice and ash, and saw the smokes for the first time. And so I brought that history and I worked uh, actually with uh, our archives and the archives are fabulous here and they, all, they gave me the images to take a look at and I was so pleased to have access to that and those actually are in the book too. We selected I think about 20 images and um, so I really appreciate the uh, UAA archives. And uh, so I use that and then in addition to that I put in four galleries of photographs, and then I wanted to enlist also the, um, 
I wanted somebody that was an expert, that understood really the physical nature of the place. And so the guy that was out there was uh, John Eichelberger, who was with the AVO and also with, uh, with the University of Alaska at Fairbanks. And John uh, ended up in Reston, Virginia, working as a hazards, volcano hazards coordinator for the past several years, and now has come back to Alaska, the bum. <laughs> is back up in Fairbanks, and he is uh, the the uh, graduate dean up there, the dean of the graduate program in, at the University of Alaska in Fairbanks. So he's back at home again. But John, uh, in talking with him, I said, you know, I think people would enjoy kind of an understanding of how this place is plumbed, because I think of it kind of like plumbing out there, because you really have five, actually six active volcanoes within about a 25 kilometer area. And some of them are smoking them, some are dormant. There are several sort of extinct volcanoes in that area. But uh, you're completely surrounded by these things. And so I wanted a little bit better understanding as to why this place is really important. And so John wrote really a, a fabulous uh, essay. And I said, I'd read many of his, uh, his uh, the papers that he's written about this place, and I really to be honest, I can't get much into it because I don't have the language that goes along with it, with the geology. I wished I did. But I get a general understanding of it. But John uh, wrote an art, actually an essay for it that uh, really did a wonderful job in explaining the purpose of, of why this is really an important area of the world to study, especially for volcanologists. And I wanted to add a human element to it also, so I talked with Jean Schaaf. Uh, with the National Park Service, and she's been with Lake Clark and Katmai National Park, and also Antioch Czech National Monument. And I said, Jean, I said, you know, it would be nice to sort of humanize this, that I want to know how the people reacted to it, because, you know, some of us live in and around volcanoes. Some of you have probably been, you know, buried in ash from either Reed Out or, who knows, Spur, and some of the others that have blown up over the past 20, 25 years. So we understand these things a little bit, but uh, how do we react to them? And she uh, got some first-hand accounts, actually, from uh, the peoples that lived out there. And uh, she wrote really a fabulous uh, essay called Witness, which is in the book as well. So it, uh, it brought in people of science to go along with the more aesthetic things. I know uh, looking at Griggs' work in the past, it was more of a scientific study that Robert Griggs was doing out there. In his four expeditions, actually, there were five, but Griggs was on four. And uh, I wanted to look at it more from an aesthetic point of view, that uh, there's something of beauty to me in a place such as this. And what uh, it didn't sink in again the first time I went out there in 2000, this came later, that um, uh, I've got other connections. And I was talking briefly with Rachel that, uh, that not only the educational component, but also I spent uh, two years in Vietnam. And uh, when I had an opportunity to get away from the noise and destruction of, of that, I went to Japan and I spent some time in the, uh, the Zen gardens, which totally I just fell into these places. I didn't, uh, didn't realize in my wanderings through the city by myself what they were until I walked in there. And even then I didn't understand it, but I knew it was a place that was quite different than the activity and energy really of the war. And it just sort of relieved me of all this this energy and all the destruction and so forth that, that I saw in Vietnam, that when I was in the gardens themselves, they were so quiet, they were so peaceful, that it seemed to kind of really be a wonderful balance. And so not being Buddhist, um, I didn't have a full understanding of what was going on there. But what I did realize is that it was really a wonderful comparison. And it really made my, it just made everything better for me at that time. And so our day-to-day -day living is quite hectic sometimes. Uh, you know, just your job and being in places and having to, to be here and be there. That uh, when you do go into a place like the Valley of 10,000 Smokes or any place in the wilderness of Alaska, that really it's not the clock that dictates things anymore unless you're on a deadline. And when I go into the valley, I realize I make a, a pact with my pilot and I say, he drops me off. and. More often than not, I've been dropped off by myself out there. So this is a venture really entirely on my own, and I have no means of communication. 
I carry a small little handheld GPS mainly, so if I get lost, and it's not so much losing my place within the valley, but if the fog comes in, you're not going to see 20 or 25 feet away in which direction you're going to go. So every morning it could be clear as it was this morning when I got up. I'll set my waypoints as I go on a, on a, in a certain direction so that I can take those waypoints and find my way back, which has happened twice to me out there. I got caught in the fog and didn't know which way to go, so I had to rely on that little device. But other than that, I just hope I don't break my leg or some other sort of thing happens. But that causes me to be just that much more alert and to observe really what's going on around me. And so it slows me way down because I don't want to get myself in too much trouble as I'm wandering about out there. And when I do that, then I become much more of an observer of what's happening in that area. And so I've spent uh, a lot of time roaming around these places. And what I found is that in Sitka, when, when uh, Ernie had talked to me about the valley, he was seeing images that really looked not unlike the images that uh, I remember from, from the Ranji Garden and some of the other Zen gardens that when you walk in and you see the raked sand and you see the stones that are placed very strategically through an area. And then you go back the following day, the stones are all in the same place, but they've raked the sand differently. So there's always this constant change that's taking place. But there's always that sort of solidity that happens also. That these things became really important to me. And the same thing is true in the valley, that when I went out there, and over a period of 11 years, I've been back and forth, I see there is change that's taking place. And actually, I was so excited in 2011 because one little route that I was taking between Nova Erupta and a place called Peace Soup Pass in between two, two sedimentary mountains, there was a little pine tree about this tall, mm -hmm. the first one. And so lichens begin and, and life comes back to the place. And it's, it's just an interesting environment to see that when the volcano blows up, it's not unlike a war that when a bomb goes off and I've built all sorts of shape charges and I've set off all sorts of things that are tremendously noisy. But after that explosion, and certainly after the eruption of Nova Erupta, when this, when this went off, they, they could hear it in Juneau, from what I understand. It's a long way away. And so it must have been tremendously noisy. But after this is all done, and after the smokes have disappeared, it's, it's like a vacuum. All that noise has created a sense of vacuum. So when I walk into this, it has that same feeling where there's really nothing there until you find it, and you come across a certain thing. But anyway, I, I don't know where I'm going with this. I'm just having a great discussion <laughs> with myself. But I did want to talk a little bit about Griggs and the Valley of 10,000 Smokes. This is an overrupt that taken in about 1918. So it's really about uh, six years after the eruption, and it's still smoking. And if you go out there today, you're going to see about seven smokes, and they're all still in that area. Especially on a really damp, cool day, you'll see the steam coming off the top of the vent. And on this side of it, down at the bottom, right about here, there's two smokes down there. And it's a great place to take a nap because it just warms you with the steam. And there's no real strong sense of sulfur in other things. It just has this really wonderful, earthy steam in this too. But things have changed out there. But I do want to prove that I was there. But primarily, the first picture is, uh, is one of, of Griggs, and uh, they call it the pack train. And in this particular picture, you see these guys walking in front of Nova Rupta and all of the steam and so forth that's there. And in 2002, I walked through the same path. And you can see that things have changed in that place. And uh, right behind it, uh, you can see a little bit of Mount uh, Katmai way off in the distance. And in the upper right, you can see part of Trident Mountain, which still oozes. I think in 1953, they had an eruption up there that's still oozing some volcanic material. So all these are, are still active. If you have any questions while I'm going along, please. Uh,
please let me know, especially if I start to, to get ahead of myself. In 2000, this is the first thing that I saw when I walked up to Three Forks, which is the meeting of rivers, the Lethe River, uh, Knife Creek, and Windy Creek. This is really looking up the Lethe. And uh, what you're looking at, again, is, is what they call the ignimbrite sheet. It's a weldment of pumice and ash. And in some places, it's very soft. Some places, it's like walking just on a floor on cement, depending on how the wind and how the weather and the environment is affecting it. But uh, it's hard for people to realize, especially uh, out east where they don't deal with volcanoes so much. I know that when I've talked to people about Katmai and volcanoes, they're not familiar with them. But when they see this, it's just like, well, it's a river going. But when I tell them, well, you're looking at about a 35-foot wall of ash, that it's hard to, hard to believe that what we're looking at is, again, just this, it's almost like a glacier of just ash, of this rock that's there. And uh, over the past hundred years now, of course, uh, Katmai celebrated its 100th anniversary last summer, on June the 6th, and it was a big deal with the Park Service. And uh, it's, uh, it's, it's still quite a wonderful place, and very little seems to have changed other than erosion and wind that, uh, that has dramatically changed some of these areas out there. But as I see the place, I didn't really see a moody place. But I think, you know, being an artist, that's part of my job is to instill into the images what, what I feel when I'm out there. That when I'm in the valley or any place in the wilderness, to be honest with you, the wilderness doesn't care if I'm there or not. It really doesn't care. And if I go drown in a river, it doesn't care either. That it's, you know, it's, it's the environment and I think you know, being an artist, I'm always interested in, in the expression, not so much my own, but the connection that I can make to it. And I don't ever feel like I'm one with these places. I've never gone that far into it, that I always realize that it's almost like being a guest in these places as I wander through. But um, it's that environment, and I think it's just the, uh, the experience that I bring back from it that uh, really is important to me. And it spurs on really the, the next project or the next idea that, that I want to work with out there. But uh, when I saw this and I developed a negative and I made a print of it, I got really excited. Because all of a sudden I began to create a stronger sense, a, a stronger, I guess, connection or communication with what I was beginning to see in this place. And um, it, to be honest, it is moody. I get a lot of rain on me and it got cold. And I was pelted a lot by the uh, the pumice as it you know flew through the air, but uh, it uh, it was quite amazing. I'm sort of taking you on really a trip through the valley right now, and this is really the beginning. And you wander, as I mentioned, through Windy Creek, and you walk along the buttress range, which is on the right hand side, and kept an awful lot of the volcanic material of moving further to the south. But uh, it filled, again, that, that area up to 1,000 feet of ash. Right here, it's probably maybe 500 feet deep. And this is uh, actually the Lethe River that, uh, that is running through the sheet right now. And you're looking off into the distance at a dacite dome volcano of uh, Mount Cerberus. And really, the northern flanks of Mount McGeek, which is on the far right, which is an active volcano, and absolutely a beautiful feature. Um, and this is a crossing point of the Lethe River, and what we're looking at is last year's snow bridge. So if you look down in there, you see the coupling that's taking place. And so I crossed right here, and I had to use, like, I use poles, like ski poles without the baskets on them. And I began to kind of do this sort of thing just to see if it goes down. And if it does, I know there's uh, nothing underneath there, and I don't want to go there. But as I punch through, and I realize that, that hopefully it'll hold my weight, and I'll cross and go up to the other side, which is what I did. And this is uh, the southern flank, really, of, of, of Bank Mountain, which will lead up to the shelters. And I think I have an image of that coming. But before, I wanted to show you a, an extinct fumarole. And uh, a little bit about uh, most of the images that uh, I'll show you today are black and white. I did do some color. And I have a colored image of this one as well, and it is brightly colored. The fumaroles themselves are steam vents, and what happens, of course, you've got 
all of these feet of hot, almost molten rock. And then all these mountains are filled with snow and it rains and you get all of this stuff that's flushing in during the eruption, especially during the eruption when all of that hot volcanic material get up into these glaciers and melted a lot of that. And so you mix this all up with, uh, with water and you've got all of these steam vents and for years and years they were, they were transporting steam actually as the water got down into the, into the hotter layers below it would transport the steam up and with that it would carry metals with it which deposited really on the surface and you begin to see these really wonderful sort of dimples and these things are any they range in size from just a couple of feet up to in this particular case probably 15 to 18 feet in length and in the center there's bright reds and there's, there's oranges and yellows you can see all the different metals that were brought up to the surface and so it is colorful that way. And, uh, but at the same time, for some reason, I guess I spent so many years with these old masters and uh, of course colored film and colored materials were not very good back in the 50s and 60s. That uh, if you've got pictures that go back that far, they're probably sort of a light faded magenta by now. But uh, as we get a little bit closer to more contemporary days, especially with the, the digital work, it, it lasts. Yes? Are there similar structures in Yellowstone National Park? You know, I don't know. I've seen some of the mud pots and things out there where you've got the boiling, but I would imagine if you look around, you can find them, that there's still is the steam vents and certainly some of the geysers and things would transport some of the metals. But I haven't spent that much time in Yellowstone, and I hope an event like that doesn't come around for a long time. That's a, that's a hundred times bigger, really, than, than the Katmai event. Can you tell me about what the elevation is of the valley floor? About 1,300 to 1,400 feet. And then the mountains themselves, I think McGeek goes up to about uh, 4,500 feet. So, yeah, it's, a, it's not that difficult to, to walk around there, certainly in comparison to McKinley and some of the others when you get up to Can you see any wildlife at all in the valley? Oh, yes. Yep, uh, I don't know if I've got a picture, but there are bears out there. And so, I don't know if you've, you know, for those of you who've been out there, if you've run into them, Big tracks. Like yeah, their tracks are about like that. But every time I've been out there, I've seen the bears. <coughs> and in my last trip, I ran into uh, a mother and a couple of cubs. And I got probably 50 or 60 yards from those guys, and that was close enough. But uh, I've run into several out there, and, and I'll tell you a little story. I think uh, it might show up here in just a minute. But uh, there are bears out there. I also danced with a rabbit. That I was walking in the fog, and this is one of the times when I had the GPS trying to get me back, and I was walking over the western flank of Broken Mountain, and I couldn't see hardly anything ahead of me, and I was just kind of going by my GPS, and as I was walking over this terrain, I noticed movement out of the corner of my eye. What in the world? Because around me there are all these chunks that have been thrown out of the volcano, they call them bombs. And when the volcano erupts, it puts out all of the ash and the pumice and so forth, and then it'll spit out these larger chunks. And these guys are resting all over in the surface out there. And I thought it was a bomb, but uh, it moved. And then it stopped, and I'm sitting there looking at this thing, and I don't understand, and I sort of walked a little bit toward it, and then it looked up at me, and I realized it was a rabbit. And it must have been changing because it was the funniest looking rabbit I've ever seen. It was the skinniest thing. And at the same time, it, it, it would probably snowshoe because it had darker ears and then it had big tufts of white coming right out of the top of the ears. And I looked at it, and if I take a step toward it, it would go back that far. And if I walked this way, it would come toward me. And, and I began to walk again, and it followed me. And then we just sort of looked at each other, and I just, you know, this is the most strange thing I've ever encountered with an animal out there. Because he didn't know what to make him either, probably. But finally, he just got bored with me and just left. And I, and I proceeded on. And then I've, so I've seen the rabbit, and I've seen one fox out there that just walked by about 10 feet from me, and just looked at me, and just kept going, didn't slow up or anything else. Three sets of snow buntings were out, and they actually live in, in Nova Rupta, so I saw those. And then I saw wasps, and that's about it. So I haven't seen any other animals. But the bears are out there, 
And they primarily, primarily use it, I think, as a throughway from Shalikov Strait over to, especially at this time of year when they want to be fishing at Brooks Camp, they'll come across. And uh, so you see the, the tracks going on, on the trail if you walk into it on the, uh, near the buttress range. But I've seen them also eating grasses when I came off the top of uh, Mount Katmai. There was a little valley, and you'll see some small grasses where it can collect in these, in these little eroded valleys. And, the bears will hang out there and eat, but they really don't pay any attention to me out there. I think they see a lot of people, so they, they're interested, but not that interested in you. Not like you'd find in other places, and I know Marion has been to Antiochak, and I spent last summer in Antiochak by myself for eight days, and there were two bears in the, in the volcano at that time. And they're a lot more inquisitive because they don't see the people out there, but that's another story. Anyway, you, you get to see these dimples as you're walking around the central floor of the Valley of 10,000 Smokes. To the left is the buttress range, so if you do walk into the valley, chances are you'll go through Windy Creek and you'll walk right along the base of that, between that and the Lethe River. You'll cross over the Lethe and then this, these things you'll begin to see in the central part of, uh, of the, the valley. One thing is that it, it, uh, the clouds will come up it can be an absolutely pure and cloudless day. And in a minute, something like this will show up and it'll just be this big tube of a cloud that'll come over the center of it. And minutes later, the winds will come up. And when the winds come up, it begins to blow pumice and ash and all sorts of things. And I've seen pumice the size of peas flying through the air and it hurts when you get hit with that stuff. So I put a mask on and all sorts of other things because I've seen dust devils that go up a thousand feet out there that actually come down through the center part of the valley and then disappear into uh, the glacial moraine really on the, uh, the western side. But the clouds, when I begin to see these things, I begin to pay attention because oftentimes they'll call in the weather. And I think I've got an image yeah, of um, so often this is what it looks like out there. It's damp, it's wet, it's cold, and it gets, at least from my perspective, moody. It's a very moody experience. But one thing I've learned is that in doing photography out there, that I, on the clear cloudless days, I do the sort of magnificent vision, or vistas, I should say, that Ansel used to do. You've got these things that go to infinity. And um, it's almost the ideal. And when you get days like this, it causes you to look a little closer. And on the days where I really am limited by visibility, you get a much more intimate connection with what's going on around you because it forces your eye to, to really what, what is in your immediate environment. So one thing I've enjoyed is I don't wait for the good days. I'll go out whenever I can. If it's blowing too hard, if there's too much snow, I've been caught out there in six inches of snow. We got dumped on one night, and that was right at the solstice. And so it, it was cold and damp. So you're prepared for that, but uh, you take advantage of whatever you're given in that area. Yes? How much do you incorporate Hansel Adams zone theories into your, your photography? I did a lot of that. I, uh, I worked actually with Oliver Galliani, who took the zone system to extremes. And he was a real disciplinarian. And um, so I used that, but I, mostly on 4x5. And so I've carried a 4x5 with me for years. And I was going to take that out there, but this is not a good environment for 4x5. Mainly because you're loading film holders. And um, with the dust, the dust out there, when it flies, it's like powdered sugar. And it's like little platelets, and it gets into everything, and you're not going to get it out. I've sat, and I've brushed, and I've done everything I can to get the dust out of the equipment. It just doesn't want to go out. So I took two cameras with me, and they're the biggest roll film cameras I could find. They're Fuji 6 by 9 centimeters. So it gave me a, a 2 and a quarter by about a 3 and a quarter, 3 and a half inch negative. And that worked out really well for me. So then I was running rolls of film through there rather than having to deal with the film holders. But I did, uh, I was always concerned about um, the exposures. And so I would use the zone system. On days that, where the zones were, were too far, I would compact my developments and expand the developments. So yeah, in the back of my head, I was doing that sort of thing, if you're into the technical, technical side of it. Since then, and I'll talk a little bit about 
the digital world has come around, and maybe toward the end we'll have a chance to, to talk briefly about that. But weather is an important factor in this place. And you know, you're Alaskans, so you understand what weather can do up here. So this is nothing new to you, but to people that live back in the, the more docile places in the world, it's hard to imagine you know, the type of weather that can come on you. And one thing that Kathy and I, I think, really miss a lot is that the activity of the natural world and the wilderness that, I mean, if the earth is shaking, it's an earthquake. You know, we live through them. If the volcano blows up, it, it dumps ash on us. Well, that's the way it is. You know, you, you put part of a pantyhose on your, on your air cleaner so, you know, it doesn't get into the end. You, you know how to live with this stuff. But back in Virginia, if we get a little bit of snow, everybody comes on and everything is a hazard and it's just, you know, it's a real problem. And, and when I lived back there years ago when I was in the Navy, we get two inches of snow, everybody drive into the ditch. That was what they did. And, you know, schools canceled for days, you know, prior to that. So it's, it's a totally different environment. I love it back there. There's something really convenient and wonderful about it, but we miss you know, the, the natural world and, and less of the R factor, that is that you're much closer with your skis and with everything else to what goes on around you. So I think, as I'd mentioned uh, in a film and with other interviews that, uh, I forget what I was gonna say. It'll come back to me. It's just, it's just the natural environment, I think, that we miss. But anyway, take you for, further beyond the weather and show you the wonderful volcanic nuts <laughs> that, uh, you know, it doesn't look like much when you're up there, but I have to tell you that after you've been hiking all day long with an 80 pound pack, which is what it took to get me out there for, you know, two weeks worth of food and all my equipment and uh, clothing, and film, and this and that, I had a big pack on my back and then I had another pack on front that just housed all my camera equipment. And um, when I saw these huts for the first time, it's about a 300-foot climb from the central part of the valley up to these guys. They really look good. Because <laughs> number one, you didn't have to set a tent. And if you set a tent out there, the wind will come up and it'll buffet you all night long. You'll be out night, all night resetting stakes or whatever. But um, when you get to it, the, you're looking at really three structures. The one closest to you is the most palatial of the three, but it actually has a nice floor in it. It's got four bunks in it. The one just beyond it is called the Cook's Hut, and that's essentially got bunks in it as well. It's a little more spartan, and then the one on the far right is uh, primarily a tool shed where the volcanologists, the uh, geologists keep their stuff, but uh, you can see from the inside that it's rather wonderful and this was taken some time back because the windows now are pretty much all entirely duct tape because they've had a lot of problems with the with the weather and I've spent some nights in here a lot of nights alone and um, I'm so pleased to be there because that whole thing the, the, the whole structure will just shake in the wind and you can hear all of that pumice just really beating against the against the side of the walls. And if you stand outside and you look at it, you'll see where the wood is nailed onto the structure. It's scalloped like this. Nails will be here, but the pumice has completely sanded these things back. It's just, it's amazing to see. But uh, I was out there with the volcanologists who I have deep respect for. John Eichelberger will bring a group of people out there in June people from all around the world, graduate students and others that are interested in volcanology, and he takes them through parts of the valley and he talks about the importance of, of volcanology and especially this place. But these guys are crazy. Got any geologists in here? Oh, good. <laughs> well, I envy you a lot because if I were to come back in another life, I'd want to be a geologist because they truly have fun out there. And they are in great shape. These guys get in a line and they take off, poof, just like a little train, they're gone. And I'm sitting back there hauling my stuff, trying to keep up with these guys. And they truly love what they do. I'm standing out there in this place completely covered from head to toe. They're walking around out there in shorts. 
and they've got boots and gaiters on. So the, the middle part of their legs are bare, and I went up with them onto Nova Rupta. And that's glass. It's all these tremendously sharp glass shards. These guys climbed right up in there, and I'm sitting there looking at them all as John is giving a little talk about Nova Rupta. And I was taking pictures and just enjoying this whole thing. And I looked around at them, and their knees were all bleeding. And their legs were all cut up, and my pants were completely shredded, but you know, I had a little bit of protection. When I got back to the huts, these guys sat around at night, boiling up a big pot of, well, they, they took water, and they didn't bother to filter it, so it's, it's full of ash. <laughs> they boil it up, and they pour instant potatoes into it. They mix it all up, and it looks like mud and little bits and pieces of pumice are still in there. And then they add a can of something that looks like dog food to it. They mix that all in there, and four of them are sitting around and they're eating. And you hear a big crunch once in a while. Somebody's just got a piece of pumice in that mold. And as I'm sitting there, and I'm just laughing, you know, because to myself, because I'm out there with my little water purifier, and I'm trying to get clean, beautiful water once you purify it. But they didn't bother. I asked John about it. I said, what's the deal? These guys are eating glass, you know? And he said, it's not a problem. They, they've been doing it for years. But as I'm, I'm observing these guys eat this stuff, I'm looking at their knees, and they've got bits and pieces. They've got shards of yoga up there in their knee, black, and blood is coming out. And they don't seem to recognize that. And I'm sitting there, I said, these guys really have grit. I mean, they, you know, they're the world. They, they carry, they study this stuff, and they take it with them. You know, they're literally, literally, take literally they take it with them. And so I have really a deep admiration for them, and they love what they're doing out there. And so I, I learned a lot from the geologists, and I think that's probably one of the greatest things that I've, that I've received from doing this book, is that I've gone beyond myself, and I've, I've connected up with Arlene, and I've connected up with all sorts of other people that are in the archives or in the science, sciences of Gene and John and, and the volcanologists that I've met out there. And um, they've become interested in the project. So it's become so much larger than, than what I envisioned. Were those huts airlifted out there? To be honest, I would think they are, but I don't know for sure. They uh, they helicoptered a lot of things in there. There's a small outhouse out there that blew over, and it's nothing more than than two pieces of four by eight plywood with the backing on it. And I have to tell you, it had a great view. <laughs> you could look right out over Broken Mountain, and it's the second best view I've ever seen. The first has got to be at the 14,000 foot level on Mount McKinley. When you're looking out at Hunter and Four Acre, it's just spectacular. But anyway, they have brought things out there. there the cans, the big 55 gallon oil drums you saw out there, those don't exist anymore. They dragged those out. So they're trying to clean it up. And I think if the Park Service had their way, they would also get rid of the shelters, that they would like to take it back to, to its natural environment. But the shelters really, I think, are a good safety, safety valve out there. And it's a wonderful place, really, to, to hold up for a while. So Why? Why what? Remove the shelters. Um, I think that they would prefer to bring it back to, uh, to what it was prior to the shelters, that they'd like to. I know that John wanted to do some drilling and stuff out there.